know, sometimes it's very much about a sort of phenomenological sensing of a place and a time. I like the fact that field recordings put you in the reality. It's not pure artifact. All of a sudden, it's the materiality of the world. I have a belief that everything is alive. It doesn't need to be as, as obvious as a plant or as plain as an animal. So in that sense, everything sort of stores memory in a way. I think these kinds of spaces, you know, have a kind of spectral ambience and you can kind of tap into that if you're receptive to those ambiences. Field recording could just be recording, it could be anything. It's basically an umbrella term, isn't it, for recording sound and, you know, there's so many different ways of doing it now and also just depends on the individual, what kind of sounds spark an interest in that listener and compels them to then go and record it. And so it could be recording music or musicians, but it could be recording like ambient sound or wildlife, nature. Yeah, it's just completely open, isn't it? It is like two distinct histories. And if you look at the sort of popular usage of the word in the early part of the 20th century, right up until probably like the 60s, it was embedded in this kind of ethnographic tradition. And I think there was this shift that took place and you know I really see Luke Ferrari's piece Pesco Rier as being that point of the shift where suddenly field recording became a creative enterprise you know you were listening to someone else's listening and that for me is now how I conceptualize field recording. I've been really interested in how wildlife or environmental recordings have been incorporated into music. Going back to people working in music halls, so it's before recorded sound. And then, of course, you've got music concrete, and you've got the work of Pierre Schaeffer, and you've got Hugh Davis and Jim Fassett, who did some really interesting work in the 50s and 60s, um, and Cabaret Voltaire. I mean, there's so many people that have worked with field recordings. I think because what you can do with them is, is limitless, really. I actually think the important change was accessibility of the equipment. Suddenly it's something really affordable. And uh, before it was this complex setups with plates or cylinders, which were hard to get and hard to operate and the fidelity wasn't there. And suddenly with the digital portable recorders, we can really just carry a recorder in our pockets. For me, it's always been a case of just recording without too much thought, very much as, a, as an immediate way of, of interacting and, and absorbing elements of my media world. There's a place called Frithelstock Priory, which is in Devon, and it's a ruin of a priory. It's basically like a haunted site. So I set up um, some instruments you know, these, these were sort of uh, what would I would deem to be like ritual instruments. Then when I was like listening to this situation, it was as though there was another frequency which came through. You know, that it wasn't being done by that being played, it wasn't being done by the combination of these things, but the combination of these things allowed this other frequency to come in. I like most of the time that you can't identify really the source and also that maybe sometimes field recordings travel from one piece to another. It happens that a water or sound that I used travels from one record to another and it doesn't bother me because I feel they are a bit like characters. Someone told me once Recording is about distance between you, your microphone, and the thing you want to record, and you have to be aware of the gesture you make. And it's true, for example, when we recorded the fish, maybe we didn't record anything, maybe yes, but there was an interaction. And that's the, with the fish and me, and that's the most important thing. I 
had a lot of spare time at some point and went for a lot of walks, started to really perceive the environment around me as an interesting sound source, like the tonal qualities of certain sounds, like for example the train. There is like so many different pitches and textures going on at the same time and plus the rhythm of all the sounds that it is mesmerizing to listen to and build upon. And then it continued into making my own mic. There was this feedback loop of improving the recording techniques, going back home, listening, and trying to capture like specific objects in the city and make some conceptual connections between them. It was just the sound quality was irreplaceable by the synthetic sounds I was experiencing before. One thing that has increasingly become important to me, you know, how it is that field recording kind of offers that sense of, of place. For me, the thing I'm always really conscious of with field recording is that it's only in that moment and then it never is again. And if you're there to be attentive to it and to capture it, you can, you know, hopefully transmit that. But if you're not, then that's it and it's, it's gone and you can never have it again. And I think that kind of is very poetic in a sense. What I love about field recording is that you only get that one chance and then that moment is gone and a different moment might present itself which might be even more interesting than the other one but you know it's about that sort of being present and attentive uh, in terms of the way that you, you listen and the way that you record. Move up from my first album. I couldn't bear to go into a proper studio, so we built a breeze block room within a crumbling room of a mill. So there was a room within a room. Because I felt that these mill spaces were quite porous and filled with presences that kind of hung in the air, and that felt something I could connect into in a sort of meaningful way. It's been so I did make use of some of the spaces in the mill. Long, cold corridors would provide a natural reverb. One guitar take I remember doing in a huge derelict room and I was getting freezing cold just as I was finishing the take. And I do feel these kinds of temperatures and ambiences imprint onto the recording methods and affect the outcome. I think we just wanted different sounds and um, yeah from that we just started recording a lot of things you know water, animals, things that we still can identify what they are because a lot of the times we'll just leave a recorder just running you know just somewhere and we'll just take it back and, and, and see what we see what we got. I'm always like curious to, you know, um, to like them empty spaces on the tracks, like the little sounds, you know, like, you know, you, you will hear like a sound and you wonder if that's, you know, if that's somebody putting down a cup or a spliff or, you know, if that was a door closing, you know, I'm, I'm quite like, you know, curious to hear what that was because that's the part that I really connect with. I think there's a different relationship that you have with a recording that you make yourself because all of that embedded, embodied experience is there and that's valuable sometimes because I think you have a sensitivity to the experiential capacity of them and you can maybe work with that in a kind of compositional way. But I think that the archive actually plays a really valid place. I mean, the, the ironic thing is, you know, all of us become archivists. Given like the kind of radio show that I present on NTS, I'm really, my interest in field recordings is a lot more serious now. So I always carry around this little like XY channel mic that slots into my phone. And it means that I can make good quality field recordings just on the go, wherever. You know, you never know when you're going to stumble across something that you want to capture the sound of. The aim is to just collect and gather sounds that I can then share with 
my listeners on the radio. I've done one on Jamaica, one on Pakistan, China, Japan, preparing the South Africa one now. It presents music and sounds and a culture and a country to people in a different way. The one I did about Pakistan, I got a lot of messages. They just loved hearing like the bird song in the morning or the call to prayer, snake charmer, just the general sound of the traffic, like the chaotic traffic in Karachi. So we've got over six and a half million sound recordings here in the Sound Archive. Um, so it's such a massive resource for people to come to and listen to and experiment with. We're working on a project at the moment, Unlocking Our Sound Heritage, which is a huge digitisation project. And what we're hoping to do is put as many recordings as possible online, which means that people will be able to go to our website, download these recordings, play around with them, create new things with them. So it's going to completely transform the way that people engage with recordings in my section, certainly. I think pedagogically and even socially, it's a very good practice to be more in peace or in curiosity with your daily life. For me, the, the bigger goal of field recording is being an active listener. So the future for me is that we keep listening. <laughs> Thank you.